This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're here. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, um, this is Russell Hummer. <laughs> and uh, we're talking about the future of APEC. He's a senior APEC official in Hawaii, the future of APEC under the Trump administration. We're also gonna talk about the Nobel Peace Prize today with Russell. Think Tech Asia. So welcome, welcome back to the show, Russell. Yeah, thank you, Jay, uh, for inviting me again. I know this is a good subject for me, and. Uh, I know the Nobel Peace Prize. I was a, a nominator. Actually, I was a candidate for the past four years from year 2012 to uh, when I first got nominated or as a candidate. I know the state legislature, the Senate president, uh, and the Speaker of the House, uh, they both nominated me, and our former governor as well. And uh, so, you know, I had a big support with the state officials here. And prior to that, I was able to influence the uh, the uh, U.S. congressional side, and get the support of the State Department, the United States Trade Representative's Office, and the President's Office as well, as uh, promoting peace to Asia Pacific region. So today I want to talk about the Nobel, uh, Alfred Nobel, who was the founder of the Nobel Peace uh, uh, Lottery. He award. invented dynamite. Exactly. A lot I think of people died because of his invention. I know. I think he he was one of the you know. The one that he actually invented, like he had over like 355 uh, patents worldwide. And if you look at the history, I know he was born in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, in uh, October 21st, 1833. And by the time he was nine years old, his father was an uh, inventor, an uh, engineer, and was into arms, like uh, making gunpowder and making bombs and stuff like that back then. And, uh, but what happened was uh, uh, his father started working in, in Russia, it was in St. Petersburg, and making these uh, 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 weapons for the Russian. For the Tsar. With the Tsar at back then. Yeah. And uh, so anyways, uh, when What's you look. What's the secret of gunpowder anyway? I'm sorry, dynamite. How, I, how does it differ from gunpowder? Why is dynamite dynamite? I think when you look at it, how Alfred uh, Nobel, the, he, he worked with the Nitroglycerin, which is a liquefied uh, chemical, it has a, a chain reaction that's like 10 or 20 times as thick as a gunpowder. So he was able to use the nitroglycerin into the dynamite with the gunpowder, so it controlled the blast, so, so it knows which direction it's going to go and the capability of the damage. So in terms of small components, uh, it had a devastating uh, effect to the uh, so not only uh, they use it in you know not even like missile, not in bombs like they're doing the World War One day. So they used to pack a lot of dynamites and meant put it into those capsule that looked like a, a projectory, and a lot of people died because of that. Yeah, and uh, so but, he made a lot of money, and he created the uh, the foundation. Yeah, yeah. I actually then those dynamites played a major role for uh, uh, revolutionize the industry worldwide because it was used for construction, mining road buildings, because you needed to blast certain bedrocks of uh, uh, granite stones yeah, and yeah, basalt yeah. to create this mining and tunneling and all that. So dynamite, that's like, like in the Cowboys and Indians, you know, we back in the uh, 1800s, you know, they used the dynamite. That was one of his inventions. And uh, when Alfred uh, Nobel, he was in the United States too. And uh, he met John Erickson, who invented the Erickson Electronics. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to Walmart, he might have those Erickson, uh, RCVs or recorders, yeah, sure, sure, you know, sure. radio. Used to make phones, yeah. Exactly, and uh, he worked with uh, John Erickson back in the 1850s. And uh, matter of fact, he had a U.S. patent on this uh, gas meters uh, back in. Uh, so he's been. He was in the United States for about a year, mm. and he went back to uh, Stockholm, uh, Sweden, and he started this uh, ammunition factory in uh, 18. Uh, uh, I think in the 1860s or in the 50s, yeah. Then what happened was in the 1962 and 64, uh, 1862, he started the ammunition factory. In 1864, there was a big accident, a blast in the in the factory, and he, he lost his younger brother in a, in a dynamite or explosion in the factory. So he felt really bad. So he wanted to control the uh, uh, 
the explosion. So in uh, 1866, they invite, he made a dynamite and got a patent on it. And that was the start. And throughout the early days of patents. Yeah, and uh, what happened was, you know, he was generating wealth, and he wasn't married. He was a single man. So when he passed away in 1896, uh, he left a will, and he wanted to start the Nobel Peace awarding for uh, the categories from physics, chemistry, literature, uh, medicine. And uh, those are awarded in Stockholm, Sweden. And they get, you get to meet the king and the queen every year. They award a Nobel for Lauderet in those categories. So there, there are various categories. Yes. And, but uh, the, by the bottom, the underscore is that, is that you got to do something for the benefit of peace. Oh, for is the benefit, right? for the uh, humanitarian, for the human rights, mm -hmm. uh, for the for sake of uh, uh, advancement for, uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot of, lot of scientists and medical doctors could get the award for uh, uh, the medicine side or even physics, you know, the you know, physics uh, So category. it's not just peace. Yeah, so it has uh, chemistry, physics, uh, literature as well. And the pieces of, the lottery for pieces in Norway also you, it's a separate, uh, but so they, you're you're up. You're not up for chemistry. You're up for peace. Yeah, I'm for the peace using uh, for my APEC master plan because I'm trying to bring peace to Asia Pacific region with my master plan. That so I let's let's talk about that. So the, the the dominations that you've received, which sound to be all across the board, and and sounds like you have a pretty good chance of winning this award, are all about your. APEC master plan, right? Actually, yeah, basically, uh, when I proposed my APEC master plan in the year 2012, when I first drafted it, uh, after, you know, state of Hawaii, we hosted a 2011 uh, APEC conference here. So the following year, I drafted up an APEC master plan, including 21 countries, and I broke it down into regions, uh, south, east, west, you know, south, and uh, more like uh, I followed uh, like the European Union's uh, uh, your zone concept, where you know we brought it, and I wanted to make Hawaii the headquarters for the northern zone. What a great idea! And uh, basically, because uh, we're more open, we can do things with due diligence. This is a plan that here in Hawaii. you, in your capacity as the senior APEC official in Hawaii, you make a plan and you you suggest this plan. What to the United States government, or maybe you suggest it to all of the member nations? There are twenty-one of them, right? Uh, of APEC, who do you suggest that plan Actually, to? Actually, when I proposed it, I proposed it to the APEC uh, organization as a whole, which the, is in Singapore, is the headquarters, mm -hmm. and, and we have an APEC National Center in uh, Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. that orchestrates uh, uh, forums and uh, uh, guest speakers, and uh, they have special conference and broken down to different categories, and uh, so. Uh, so what was special about the plan? I actually it just kind of uh, followed up the Bogart, because uh, as you know, APEC has a plan for economic development. They want all uh, 21 countries or APEC countries to have a free trade on the uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, region area. So that's one element of and, it. And uh, so I mean, you know, basically, uh, when I proposed my APEC master plan, we wanted uh, like TPP. Uh, Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership, Partnership, have all 21 countries be in it, or even with the uh, RCEP, our Regional Economic Conference, uh, Economic uh, Partnership. So the uh, plan is to give to give a, a course of action to APEC, um, make its activities, its meetings more more uh, beneficial. Yes, and basically I've been following up, and every year when the, every country hosts this uh, APEC, uh, based on my master plan, I prepare a strategic business plan. And I have done that in when we uh, in China when China hosted in uh, 2013 and 2014 was in Indonesia. Uh, uh, I mean, 13 was in Indonesia and thir uh, year 2014 was in China, Beijing, and the following year it went to Philippines and Manila, and last year was in uh, Peru, and this year is in uh, Vietnam. So I, I I just finished a strategic business plan for Vietnam. It gives, it's, Can you it's summarize a, that for us? What does uh, it say? Actually, it's a, it's a position paper. Uh, what benefits United States and Hawaii? How we can uh, do the business between on a bilateral basis and uh, with Vietnam. And if the uh, United States corporations and business wants to work with other APEC countries, they can follow that guidelines as well. So, so when you make a plan or a strategic plan like this, I guess a 
<clears throat> the master plan is one thing. The strategic plan is a part, is a smaller plan to advance one element of the master plan, I guess. Yes, and uh, basically I just wanted to look into each country's uh, weaknesses and strength, what kind of natural resources they have in terms of import, export, and what can the United States uh, assist them in that way as well. We can do the trade and commerce, and maybe in the future we can do a joint venture kind of project. So is this a bilateral thing when you do a strategic plan like this, or are you operating within the <coughs> the 21 country APEC group? Uh, actually, I, I go through the 21 countries APEC group because there's a, a business advisory council and a working group that uh, each country has a three representative from the uh, business in industry that attends the, and they, they meet 20, they meet year round. So it's like uh, all year round they meet with <coughs> different committees and uh, it's like a United Nation in a certain way. I think APEC has their own identity. And, but it's uh, economic. Yes, it's Mostly. economics, but they can tie that into other means as well. And uh, what I did was uh, I included the uh, military as well because I wanted to bring peace and get the, some of these um, uh, Ministry of Defense people involved with the 21 countries. So, and I include a RIMPAC exercise in Hawaii because mm. that creates business opportunity with a defense contractor and there's all these support groups that can, and they can tie that into the space industry and use that uh, space for the technology transfer in the military application yeah. and for the space for well, the Mars mission. And uh, You know, just last night we had the first uh, episode of um, the Ken Burns uh, film about Vietnam. And I'm fresh on that, so I'm interested to hear about the relationship as it exists today through APEC or directly between the United States and Vietnam, which is still a communist country. Yeah? Um, and especially, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the landscape created uh, by all of the trouble they've had all through the years in Vietnam, from the French arrival in 1858 on forward, uh, they've been treated badly, and we have treated them badly. And I wonder. You know, A, what is our current relationship with them? How good is it? Um, and two is, uh, what can your plan do to improve uh, what economic relations between the United States and Vietnam? Actually, uh, when I, you know, uh, drafted my uh, strategic business plan for Vietnam, I had a lot of dialogue with uh, a lot of the professors from Vietnam who was attending at the East-West Conference. Uh, center, mm -hmm. and some of my I met some of the close uh, friends. So we, you know, in terms of economics, and we had a good dialogue. And you know, I was asking them what are the needs and wants of Vietnam. And I know they wanna, you know, they're in the robustity right now. And in terms of uh, public and private policy, uh, public policy, they wanna reform their government from communist regime going to social democratic uh, reform. So in other words, they want to be more open with the businesses. Uh, they want the private sector to strive and be more entrepreneurial. Well, that's pretty good. So, and uh, I think, you know, I think Vietnam learned a lot from the, uh, in the past, what the country, what went, went because of what, what uh, because of the war they had and the hardship they went through. Yeah. So are they listening to your plan? Is Vietnam listening? Is the United States listening? Um, are they going to take heed from what you've suggested in the strategic plan between the United States and Vietnam? I think it's going to give them a guideline. It gives them, uh, you know, the way I prepared my business plan is like I wanted to use existing laws uh, in terms of rural law and what's out there and this is what we can offer and what Vietnam needs and wants are and vice versa, Vietnam wants to do good with the United States and uh, they want to work with us. And we have so much cultural student exchange with Vietnam right now. We have the Scheidler College yeah, has we a have significant installation in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so much Vietnamese uh, Americans that live in, in Hawaii as well with the continental United States that they're contributing citizens. Uh, and they've been, you know, they've been since in, after the Vietnam War, they, you know, they migrated here and they want to do good and uh, they have proven that they're uh, they're good Americans uh, in general. Okay, so it's, it's a fertile ground for a good relationship. Um, we'll take a short break. Uh, Russell, Russell Hanma, uh, the senior uh, U.S. senior official for APEC Hawaii, in Hawaii. We're talking about uh, APEC and we're talking about the Nobel Peace Prize that he's been nominated for. We'll be right back and we'll find out where the Trump administration figures in all of this. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. 
Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Hi, I'm Ethan Elm, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Okay, we're the, back. We're live. This is Think Tech, Think Tech Asia. We're here with Russell Hamna. He's the U.S. Uh, senior official for APEC in Hawaii. That's the uh, APEC is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Cooperation. <clears throat> Funny name. Mm -hmm. But they've been meeting for a long time. There are 21 countries involved, and Russell's been with them a long time. He's been at these meetings that they have around the Pacific Rim. And he's been writing their master plan to develop a business among the members, which is what APEC is really all about. So, um, so you, you wrote the, the master plan, and you wrote this strategic plan with uh, Vietnam, which I think is important. Um, and uh, you've been nominated for the Nobel uh, Peace Prize as a result of your efforts in this regard. Where does the Trump administration fit in all this? They don't like TPP. Uh, I'm not sure they like APEC. Do they like you, Russell? I think uh, you know. I think that you know, in terms of the uh, the State Department, and in terms of uh, Mr. Trump or the President Trump, uh, uh, I think he knows me. You know, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, the Trump University and study some real oh, estate right? and development. So yeah, yeah. he thinks I'm one of his uh, predecessors that actually went through the Trump <laughs> University. But uh, <laughs> but you know, I got my own vision and all, my own. Uh, you know, actually, it's funny how it happened. When I proposed my APEC master plan and when I drafted it, you know, I didn't see it. It was going through that direction because I wanted to kind of unify the uh, Asia Pacific region uh, and with the free trade agreement, following the Bogar doctrine of having all APEC uh, countries have a free trade area mm -hmm. by year 2020, which gives us about three years. And uh, time is a waste. Of exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, but I think in terms of. Uh, the new this administration with uh, President Trump, with we have a good team with Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. He understands where I'm coming from, as well as our United States Trade Representative uh, Robert Lysenhauer, and uh, you and we have our United Nations uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley, and she knows that you know what my efforts are all about and trying to bring peace to the region by not creating any devastation of, uh, and I and I wanted to apply my. Uh, because in the past, I did draft a resolution with the state legislature, and that went to the United Nation as a guidelines. And I went with the North Korea the issue. North Korea, yeah. With the missile crisis. And I wanted to have some kind of uh, peace signing treaty, if possible. Because there never was a peace treaty between. Exactly. It was still uh, pending. North and for South the, Korea. Yeah, the North Korea treaty never happened uh, yeah. on the uh, DMZ zone over there. So what happened was they separate North and South Korea, and uh, and so. So you think still, a treaty would help? I think if you know we try to do that with the Six Nations Security Talks, so that's been pending already. Negotiate so. a resolution of the or some kind of means dispute. to have a dialogue again. I think now with all this. What happened that's to happening. the six-party talks? They seem to go off the table. I guess we lost century because China kind of shied away, and uh, and the Russian didn't want to. Because uh, back in about two years ago, three years ago. When had that land grabbing with uh, Ukraine, with the Crimea incident, uh, with uh, the Russian Federation uh, crossing over the border, and I guess just so what happens is a retaliation, and uh, the G8 countries when uh, 
uh, Russia was a member of the G8, and they kind of took Russia out with the G7 countries. So, right. so Vladimir Putin felt kind of sour, you know, and uh, he didn't want to cooperate as much with. Uh, so the, the six-party talks fell apart. Yeah, fell apart. Yeah, I think that in order to bring the North Korea, you got to get the Russians uh, involved. Uh, I think they can have a, uh, not only the. Uh, China, because they said, you know, we're blocking the economic trade, like 90 percent of, uh, because of the economic sanction in the uh, United Nations, uh, and like 30 percent of uh, oil are being embargoed right now yeah. with sanctions. Well, you need Russia for sanctions, you need China for sanctions, you, and you need them on a Security Council to help you out if you want to do sanctions, and we don't have them, so I really wonder whether the, the administration's moves to uh, increase the sanctions on North Korea really, really will work given um, you know, the, the, the diplomatic difficulties we've been having with both Russia mm -hmm, and China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I think, like uh, we said, that everything's on the table. But we want to have a uh, democracy kind of a protocol approach or diplomatic kind of approach. Uh, we don't want to go out and kind of destroy any regime or well, anything. Yeah. And we just want to make sure that uh, our international community is trying to uh, resolve this issue as well. But so you know, the problem is trust, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, that uh, movie last night, and we'll see a, a few more segments of it as we go through the week here, um, really portrayed um, uh, the ugly American in terms of foreign policy in Vietnam. Um, that one thing after another, we made mistakes, we alienated people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we did things that, that did not bespeak of trustworthiness, um, right down to the time we, we took helicopters off the roof. Um, we were not trustworthy in terms of dealing with the situation. And I think, you know, we've done this in other countries, too. Mm -hmm. Our foreign policy and our presidents over many, many presidents, presidential administrations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have done things that suggest to people that we're not trustworthy. So when uh, Kim Jong-un says, um, I just want my nuclear bomb, just leave me alone, I want my nuclear bomb, and I don't want to have economic relations, right? I don't want to be part of a community of nations. I don't want to be part of the, of the APEC 21 or 22, as it would be if he was involved. Um, you know, I, part of that has to be based on a lack of trust, don't you think, that he's not going to make any headway um, by having relations with you know, APEC and the uh, American diplomatic mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. uh, when he doesn't trust them. So what I hear somehow in all of this is that what you're suggesting, what you would like to see is, is greater trust uh, and an economic relationship with North Korea as a solution to the present, you know, standoffish controversy with North Korea. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, you know, we would like to see the unification with South and North Korea as a one Korea. And if not, uh, at least uh, we would like to keep Kim Jong Un's uh, regime open, but they got to open up. And just like when we had that East and West uh, Berlin with uh, uh, East and West Germany, remember that famous speech that Ronald Reagan this, I dare you, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. And it started collapsing. That was brought the Eastern Europe and the Western Europe together, and brought the communist regime and the de democratic regime together. And I think uh, if you, uh, it's just a lack of communication. And you know, even the North Koreans, I think uh, maybe the top regime on the Kim Jong Un regime is so up there that you know they don't want to deal. But I think in terms of the regular people. They're just afraid of the uh, Kim Jong-un regime. I know they want to just want to probably just walk out and uh, defect their country, and but they're so afraid of their retaliation oh, yeah. uh, their, to their family, to their you know mothers and fathers if yeah. they leave the country. So, you know, I so think you think the Trump administration <laughs> has the possibility of negotiating what do you want to call it an economic resolution of this matter, and having Kim Jong-un stand down on his weapons building. Uh, in, in return, we could enter into all kinds of trade deals with North Korea and make them wealthy. Uh, I mean, that's what I hear you saying. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, we'd like to see you know, what's the, the right protocols. We'd like to have the United Nations go there with their uh, arms control, with the inspectors, like we did with Iran and other, other countries, and make sure that uh, their nuclear program is not uh, they're just going to use it for energy, not to, you know, producing yeah. Ukrainian but or the Trump administration is not going bombs. there. The Trump administration <clears throat> isn't going there in Iran. I mean, that's a, mm -hmm. a very tense arrangement with mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. agreement that Obama made. 
Um, and uh, certainly he has no great intention, or apparently no great intention, of making an economic solution with North Korea either. Uh, it takes leadership, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, really extraordinary leadership, because it's extraordinarily complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But do uh, you think the Trump administration is going to be able to turn around and fashion a deal with North Korea, you know, based on these economic solutions that you're talking about? I think we've got to rely on our, our international partners on this. Uh, like, you know, we want China, we want uh, Russia, ex ex well, uh, we want Japan to be, and the South Korean themselves got to go out and negotiate. Their own brothers and sister up in the north. Oh, they, sure. they have their own. Tragic. Yeah, they speak their own language. They know the history and the culture. And uh, so, you know, they, they got to work together themselves. I think they got to show that. Uh, it's interesting that in, in Vietnam, you know, the uh, U.S. and Britain and, and, and France uh, made an artificial boundary between North and South Vietnam at the 17th parallel, and it resulted in, in war. That's what it resulted in, which lasted a long time, uh, long before the U.S. got actively involved in the Vietnam mm -hmm. War, as a matter of fact. I think, uh, I think the and trade And now in North Korea, you have the same thing, mm -hmm. the 38th parallel. Mm -hmm. It's an artificial boundary between people of like culture, related, family, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, it didn't work. It, mm -hmm. it didn't work in terms of reunification mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even peace. Mm -hmm. It created war, and we're still effectively at war between North and South Korea. So how do you resolve that? How do you reunify them? Yeah, it's pretty hard, because you got to go back three de generation already, from Kim Jong Sun to Kim Jong Il, yeah. and with now yeah. Kim Jong uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, they had all these years of, um, I don't want to say they're being brainwashed in certain aspects, but uh, they're, they're educating in that faction that uh, the Kim dynasty is the, like, the emperor of God. So the uh, oh, yeah. supreme master of uh, yeah. all beings. So you know they they live in that kind of context and that kind of environment. So I think it's hard for the Westerners to go there and tell them this is the way to do it. Uh, He's not buying that. Yeah. So I think so uh, it's going to be hard to get him on board. Hard to get him to trust, you know, the West to trust the United States. But you are going there. I mean, you're you're building plans for APEC, economic plans for APEC, and building, uh, suggesting strategic plans uh, for the U.S. Um, economic relationship with Vietnam. And, and all that could be, a, could be a forerunner of, of the same kind of um, relationship with North Korea. I hope that happens, actually. Um, and for this, and for this, you've been nominated for, uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize. What happens now? Sounds like you've got a bunch of people on your side, Russell. Oh, you're right here. I appreciate that. <laughs> and these people are suggesting that you get the plan, uh, rather the award. Um, what happens? I think there's a selection committee, and uh, you got to go through an uh, uh, evaluation process. They pick the submission, which is a top 20. Uh, but you know, there's this act that the Nobel uh, Peace, the foundation, has this 50-year secrecy. So you, they, not, they don't disclose you what your nomination, your, your criteria was until you're 50 years uh, after. So <laughs> by the time I know exactly what my number was, <laughs> if I was a runner-up or was I in the top 20 or if not in a submission or uh, how far I, my evaluation was, I got to wait until my grandchildren to look at it from 50 years from now. <laughs> but I'm just giving a sneak preview that uh, this is what I try to do with the APEC region, try to bring peace to Asia Pacific, and uh, hopefully uh, tie this in uh, within the other 21 country because we want to use economics and business and uh, bring quality of life to Asia. Uh, yeah. for the people around yeah. there. Because, you yeah. know, time of war and all that threatening this whole war already. is so destructive. Exactly. Kind of it's, it's time to work together and have a harmony. Yeah. And that's what peace and harmony is all about. And that's so do you have any competition uh, on this award? <clears throat> Roughly uh, every year we get well over about 340 or 30 applicants for the Nobel Peace. We had uh, 7 billion people. So. Uh, just to be uh, nominated as a candidate, I think, is very It's a great special. honor. And you know, being the world's most prestigious award, and uh, you know, just to be able to, you know, uh, be in that kind of, uh, uh, not in that caliber or in that kind of uh, setting, uh, I'm just grateful that I'm lucky that I was uh, nominated as a candidate. Congratulations to you, and, Russell. And I'm just trying to give back to the community as well. I'm not making any money on this or anything. I'm just doing it because 
you know, I want to bring peace to the region. And uh, if, if I can contribute in some ways of coming up with a, a logistic of a master plan or some of the strategic business that I was able to learn and comprehend, I'd like to pass my knowledge on and Good somebody else can pick up on. And maybe the leaders themselves can realize and, and you know, trickle down to their subordinates. And you're not done. You're going to keep on doing this, aren't you? Well, hopefully if I don't get burnt out pretty soon, but, uh, you know, this kind of foreign policy and business economic development stuff, you got to be on top of it. you got to understand the culture, the dynamics of Asia Pacific. Each country is different. Each country speaks different language. Each country has different culture and some values and religion. Well, good luck, Russell. I hope you get it. Is, is there anybody I can write to, to to back you up on this? I don't know. I guess the, the announcement's coming in October 2nd, and, uh, and October 6th is the, uh, the peace lottery. And uh, so hopefully, uh, if, I, if we don't win this year, the APEC organization doesn't win this year, because I said to myself when it was an individual, I wanted to pass it on as an APEC organization. Because sure. what happened was here in 2012, the European Union won the Nobel Peace Prize lottery. So I was just saying, at the 28 countries the European Union has, and APEC region has 21 countries. And if we bring in peace to Asia Pacific region, and everybody in the APEC organization, the countries are working so hard and cooperating, working together, sharing information, you know, being transparent. And uh, so I think the organization is well deserving. I hope the APEC organization wins the APEC, uh, I mean, the Nobel Peace Prize this year. For That's long. Russell Honda. Uh, he's uh, a, a, a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize based on his work with APEC. And he's the uh, U.S. senior official for APEC in Hawaii. Thank you so much, Russell. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. <laughs>